But this is not exactly right, because both mind and body have their end. But at the same time, it is also true that they exist eternally. And even though we say mind and body, they are actually two sides of one coin. This is the right understanding. So when we take this posture, it symbolizes this truth. When I have the left foot on the right side of my body and the right foot on the left side of my body, I do not know which is which. So either may be the left or the right side. The most important thing in taking the Zazen posture is to keep your spine straight. Your ears and your shoulders should be on one line. Relax your shoulders and push up toward the ceiling with the back of your head. And you should pull your chin in. When your chin is tilted up, you have no strength in your posture. You are probably dreaming. Also, to gain strength in your posture, press your diaphragm down toward your hara, or lower abdomen. This will help you maintain your physical and mental balance. When you try to keep this posture, at first you may find some difficulty breathing naturally. But when you get accustomed to it, you will be able to breathe naturally and deeply, in sympathy with all beings, and can actually practice. So, the most difficult thing is always to keep your beginner's mind. There's no need to have a deep understanding of Zen. Even though you read much Zen literature, you must read each sentence with a fresh mind. You should not say, I know what Zen is, or I have attained enlightenment. This is also the real secret of the arts. Always be a beginner. Be very, very careful about this point. If you start to practice Zazen, you will begin to appreciate your beginner's mind. It is the secret of Zen practice. Right practice. Posture. Now I would like to talk about our Zazen posture. When you sit in the full lotus position, your left foot is on your right thigh, and your right foot is on your left thigh. When we cross our legs like this, even though we have a right leg and a left leg, they have become one. The position expresses the oneness of duality. We do not exist for the sake of something else. We exist for the sake of ourselves. This is the fundamental teaching expressed in the forms we observe. Just as for sitting, when we stand in the Zendo, we have some rules. But the purpose of these rules is not to make everyone the same, but to allow each to express his own self most freely. For instance, each one of us has his own way of standing. So our standing posture is based on the proportions of our own bodies. When you stand, your heels should be as far apart as the width of your own fist. Your big toes in line with the centers of your breasts. As in Zazen, put some strength in your abdomen. Here also your hand should express yourself. Hold your left hand against your chest with fingers encircling your thumb and put your right hand over it. Holding your thumb pointing downward and your forearms parallel to the floor, you feel as if you have some round pillar in your grasp, a big round temple pillar, so you cannot be slumped or tilted to the side. The most important point is to own your own physical body. If you slump, you will lose yourself. Your mind will be wandering about somewhere else. You will not be in your body. This is not the way. We must exist right here, right now. This is the key point. You must have your own body in mind. Everything should exist in the right place, in the right way, then there is no problem. If the microphone I use when I speak exists somewhere else, it will not serve its purpose. When we have our body and mind in order, everything else will exist in the right place, in the right way. But usually without being aware of it, we try to change something other than ourselves. We try to order things outside us. But it is impossible to organize things if you yourself are not in order. When you do things in the right way, at the right time, 
everything else will be organized. You are the boss. When the boss is sleeping, everyone is sleeping. When the boss does something right, everyone will do everything right and at the right time. That is the secret of Buddhism. Not two and not one. This is the most important teaching. Not two and not one. Our body and mind are not two and not one. If you think your body and mind are two, that is wrong. If you think that they are one, that is also wrong. Our body and mind are both two and one. We usually think that if something is not one, it is more than one. If it is not singular, it is plural, but in actual experience, our life is not only plural, but also singular. Each one of us is both dependent and independent. After some years, we will die. If we just think that it is the end of our life, this will be the wrong understanding. But on the other hand, if we think that we do not die, this is also wrong. We die and we do not die. This is the right understanding. Some people may say that our mind or soul exists forever, and it is only our physical body which dies. Your hand should form the cosmic mudra. If you put your left hand on top of your right, middle joints of your middle fingers together, and touch your thumbs lightly together, as if you held a piece of paper between them, your hands will make a beautiful oval. You should keep this universal mudra with great care, as if you were holding something very precious in your hand. Your hands should be held against your body, with your thumbs at about the height of your navel. Hold your arms freely and easily, and slightly away from your body, as if you held an egg under each arm without breaking it. You should not be tilted sideways, backwards, or forwards. You should be sitting straight up, as if you were supporting the sky with your head. This is not just form or breathing. It expresses the key point of Buddhism. It is a perfect expression of your Buddha nature. If you want true understanding of Buddhism, you should practice this way. These forms are not a means of obtaining the right state of mind. To take this posture itself is the purpose of our practice. When you have this posture, you have the right state of mind, so there's no need to try to attain some special state. When you try to attain something, your mind starts to wander about somewhere else. When you do not try to attain anything, you have your own body and mind right here. A Zen master would say, kill the Buddha. Kill the Buddha if the Buddha exists somewhere else. Kill the Buddha because you should resume your own Buddha nature. Doing something is expressing your own nature. So try always to keep the right posture, not only when you practice Zazen, but in all your activities. Take the right posture when you are driving your car and when you are reading. If you read in a slumped position, you cannot stay awake long. Try. You will discover how important it is to keep the right posture. This is the true teaching. The teaching which is written on paper is not the true teaching. Written teaching is a kind of food for your brain. Of course, it's necessary to take some food for your brain, but it is more important to be yourself by practicing the right way of life. That is why Buddha could not accept the religions existing at his time. He studied many religions, but he was not satisfied with their practices. He could not find the answer in asceticism or in philosophies. He was not interested in some metaphysical existence, but in his own body and mind, here and now. And when he found himself, he found that everything that exists has Buddha nature. That was his enlightenment. Enlightenment is not some good feeling or some particular state of mind. The state of mind that exists when you sit in the right posture is itself enlightenment. If you cannot be satisfied with the state of mind you have in Zazen, it means your mind is still wandering about. Our body and mind should not be wobbling or wandering about. In this posture, there's no need to talk about the right state of mind. 
you already have it. This is the conclusion of Buddhism. Breathing. When we practice Zazen, our mind always follows our breathing. When we inhale, the air comes into the inner world. When we exhale, the air goes out to the outer world. The inner world is limitless, and the outer world is also limitless. We say inner world or outer world, but actually there is just one whole world. In this limitless world, our throat is like a swinging door. The air comes in and goes out like someone passing through a swinging door. If you think, I breathe, the I is extra. There is no you to say I. What we call I is just a swinging door, which moves when we inhale and when we exhale. It just moves, that's all. When your mind is pure and calm enough to follow this movement, there's nothing. No I, no world, no mind, no body, just a swinging door. With great zeal, I started working on my first book. Then the cold water of reality began to douse my flames of passion for writing. I discovered that writing was difficult. I stuck with it and kept working on becoming more creative. Today I've written over 30 books, and I have at least seven more that I want to write. A young would-be author recently asked me, how do you write 30 books? My answer was simple, one word at a time. Over the years, I've found the following to be true. Creative thinking is hard work, but creative thinking compounds given enough time and focus. Creative thinking draws people to you and your ideas. Why do people continue to be fascinated by Leonardo da Vinci? Creativity is intelligence having fun. People admire intelligence and they are always attracted to fun, so the combination is fantastic. If anyone could be said to have fun with his intelligence, it was da Vinci. The diversity of his ideas and expertise is incredible. He was a painter, architect, sculptor, anatomist, musician, inventor, and engineer. The term Renaissance man was coined because of him. Just as people were drawn to da Vinci and his ideas during his lifetime, and for centuries afterward, they are drawn to creative people today. If you cultivate creativity, you will become more attractive to other people and they will be drawn to you. Creative thinking helps you learn more. It almost seems too obvious to say, but if you are always actively seeking new ideas, you will learn. Creativity is teachability. It's seeing more solutions than problems, which would belong to his estate. By using creative thinking, Priscilla Presley turned what looked like an impossible situation into a business empire that earns tens of millions of dollars a year. At this point, you may be saying, okay, I'm convinced that creative thinking is important, but how do I find the latent creativity within me? How do I discover the joy of creative thought? Here are five ways to do it. Number one, remove creativity killers. Take a listen to the following phrases. They are almost guaranteed to kill creative thinking anytime you hear or think of them. I'm not a creative person. Follow the rules. Don't ask questions. Don't be different. Say within the lines. There is only one way. Don't be foolish. Be practical. Be serious. Think of your image. That's not logical. It's not practical. It's never been done. It can't be done. It didn't work for them. We tried that before. It's too much work. We can't afford to make a mistake. It will be too hard to administer. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. Yes, but play is frivolous. Failure is final. If you think you have a great idea, don't let anyone talk you out of it, even if it sounds foolish. Don't let yourself or anyone else subject you to creativity killers. After all, you can't do something new and exciting if you force yourself to stay in the same old rut. Number two, think creatively by asking the right questions. Creativity is largely a matter of asking the right questions. Wrong questions shut down the process of creative thinking. 
they direct thinkers down the same old path, or they chide them into believing that thinking isn't necessary at all. To stimulate creative thinking, ask yourself questions such as, why must it be done this way? What is the root problem? What are the underlying issues? What does this remind me of? What is the opposite? What metaphor or symbol helps to explain it? Why is it important? What's the hardest or most expensive way to do it? Who has a different perspective on this? What happens if we don't do it at all? You get the idea, and you can probably come up with better questions yourself. That meant that I would be spending hours and hours every week of my life writing. And I would speak to an audience at least two or three times a week for the next four decades. If I don't have the innate ability to come up with the creative thoughts myself, I thought that I'll mine the creative thoughts of others. I knew that I could become a collector of thoughts more easily than I could become a creator of thoughts. Every day during the three and a half decades since then, I have read great books, gathered great thoughts, and filed them away by subject for future use. For years, as I've written lessons and books, when I need a quote, story, or article on a topic, I need only to look in my files to find several excellent pieces of material that I had filed away just for such an occasion. By becoming a person who was always on the lookout for creative ideas by others, I learned to become a creative thinker myself. You can change your way of thinking just as I did. Creative thinking isn't necessarily original thinking. Most often, creative thinking is a composite of other thoughts a person discovers along the way. Even the great artists, whom we consider to be highly original, learned from the masters before them, modeled their work on that of others, and brought together a host of ideas and styles to create their own work in the form of something new. Do you consider yourself to be highly creative? And the greater the quantity of thoughts, the greater the chance for learning something new. Finally, creative thinking challenges the status quo. If you desire to improve your world or even your own situation, then creativity will help you. The status quo and creativity are incompatible. Creativity and innovation always walk hand in hand. A good illustration of how someone challenged the status quo through creativity can be seen in the story of Elvis Presley's estate after his death. Elvis left everything in a trust for Lisa Marie, his young daughter. In 1979, Lisa Marie's mother, Priscilla, became a co-executor of the trust and found that if something wasn't done and quickly, the estate was on the road to ruin. Throughout his career, Elvis had received less than half of what he earned. Colonel Tom Parker, his manager, had a contract that took 50% of everything Elvis made right off the top. That and a lifestyle of free spending meant that Elvis was often strapped for cash. Several years before he died, Elvis sold off the rights to most of his recordings to raise money. Consequently, his estate received no royalty income from his music. Add to that situation a huge inheritance tax imposed by the government, and an empty mansion, Graceland, gobbling up money through taxes and upkeep, and you can see that the situation looked bleak. Priscilla Presley started to think creatively. First, she took the little remaining cash from the estate and invested it into Graceland. Rather than selling it, she opened it up to the public as a tourist attraction. Just 38 days after it opened in 1982, it earned back its investment. The next thing she did was sever ties with Tom Parker so that 50% of the estate's earnings would not continue being funneled to him. Finally, Priscilla began to treat Elvis as a brand. She even promoted legislation in Tennessee to make his likeness intellectual property. Number three, develop a creative environment. Negative environments are responsible for the death of thousands of great ideas every minute. A creative environment on the other hand, becomes like a greenhouse where ideas are seeded, sprout up, and flourish. A creative environment encourages creativity. When innovation and good thinking are openly encouraged and rewarded, then people see that they have permission to be creative. A creative environment places a high value on trust among team members and individuality. Creativity always risks failure. 
That's why trust is so important to creative people. In the creative process, trust comes from the fact that the people working together want what's best for the organization and each other. It comes from knowing that people on the team have experience launching successful creative ideas. And it comes from the assurance that the time coming up with creative ideas won't go to waste because the ideas will be implemented. A creative environment embraces those who are creative. Creative people are sometimes off-center. When it comes to how creative people should be treated, I take the advice of Tom Peters who says, weed out the dollars, nurture the nuts. A creative environment focuses on innovation, not just invention. Creative people say, give me a good idea and I'll give you a better idea. Fortunately, I learned this lesson early. Often I take an idea that someone else gives me and raise it to a higher level. For example, when I speak at one of my conferences, I frequently share with the audience the book idea I'm currently working on. Then I invite audience members to share their thoughts, ideas, and illustrations with me to make the book better. I tell them, I'll take what you give me, make it better, and give you the credit. <laughs> then I smile and say, then I'll sell you the book. A creative environment places a high value on options. Creative people are always thinking about and looking for other ways of doing things because they know that options bring opportunities. When anyone in my inner circle brings me an item requiring a decision, I ask for three things. The best information possible, three possible options, and their reasoning behind the option they would choose. I found that this kind of optional thinking often produces the best results. A creative environment is willing to let people go outside the lines. Most people automatically stay within the lines, even if they have been arbitrarily drawn or are terribly out of date. Creative thinkers connect the unconnected. Because a major aspect of creativity is based on utilizing others' ideas, there's great value in being able to connect one idea to another, especially to seemingly unrelated ideas. Years ago, when I began learning how to connect seemingly unconnected thoughts, I realized that it could often create something special. When you were a kid, did you ever play Connect the Dots? When you first looked at the page, it was just a jumble of dots. As you connected the dots, the picture the creator had envisioned emerged at the end of your pencil. It's easy to connect the dots if you know where you're going. Likewise, it's easy to connect ideas when you have a plan. Once you begin to think, you are free to collect. You ask yourself, what material relates to this thought? Once you have the material, you ask, what ideas can make the thought better? After that, you can correct or refine it by asking, what changes can make these ideas better? Finally, you connect the ideas by positioning them in the right context to make the thought complete and powerful. Creative thinkers don't fear failure. I firmly believe that overcoming failure is a key to success in life. In fact, I wrote a book based on the belief entitled Failing Forward. The thesis of the book is that the difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. But when it comes to creativity, the ability to be unafraid of failure is even more important. Why is that so crucial? Because creativity equals failure. Creativity requires a willingness to look stupid. It means getting out on a limb, knowing that the limb often breaks. Creative people know these things and still keep searching for new ideas. They just don't let the ideas that don't work prevent them from coming up with more ideas that do work. I believe creativity can improve a person's quality of life. Here are five specific things creative thinking has the potential to do for you. Creative thinking adds value to everything. Wouldn't you enjoy having a limitless reservoir of ideas that you could draw upon at any time? Perhaps you're not even sure what I mean when I begin to ask about whether you are a creative thinker. Let me explain a few of my observations. These are characteristics that creative thinkers have in common. Creative thinkers value ideas. Creativity is about having ideas, lots of them. You will have ideas only if you value ideas.
People most often explore ideas in their own areas of interest. For example, that's what my wife Margaret does. She has a great love for design and interior decoration. Often when we're out together looking for antiques or decor items, I am amazed at how quickly she can find exactly what she's looking for. Margaret gets dozens of catalogs and magazines, and she regularly reviews them to see new items and trends. Because she values ideas, she always has lots of them. Creative thinkers explore options. I've yet to meet a creative thinker who didn't love options. Exploring a multitude of possibilities helps to stimulate the imagination. And when it comes to creativity, imagination is crucial. People who know me well will tell you that I place a very high value on options. Why? Because they provide the key to finding the best answer, not the only answer. For example, whenever team members come to me with a problem, I insist that they also supply three possible ways to solve them as well. Anyone can point out a problem. Only people who think well can present possible solutions. Creative thinkers embrace ambiguity. Creative people don't feel the need to stamp out uncertainty. They see all kinds of inconsistencies and gaps in life, and they often take delight in exploring those gaps or in using their imagination to fill them in themselves. Creative thinkers celebrate the offbeat. Creativity, by its very nature, often explores off the beaten path and goes against the grain. Diplomat and longtime president of Yale University, Keenman Brewster, said, There is a correlation between the creative and the screwball, so we must suffer the screwball gladly. To foster creativity in yourself or a creative thinkers know that they must repeatedly break out of the box of their own history and personal limitations in order to experience creative breakthroughs. The most effective way to help yourself get out of the box is to expose yourself to new paradigms. One way you can do that is by traveling to new places. Explore other cultures, countries, and traditions. Find out how people very different from you live and think. Another is to read on new subjects. If you want to break out of your own box, get into somebody else's. Read broadly. Many people mistakenly believe that if individuals aren't born with creativity, then they will never be creative. But you can see from the many strategies and examples I've given you that creativity can be cultivated. Here's a thinking question for you. Ask yourself, am I working to break out of my box of limitations so that I can explore ideas and options to experience creative breakthroughs? Putting creative thinking into action. If you've been using some method of capturing your ideas in a notebook, computer, or filing system, I want you to take time and look through some of the ideas that you've recorded. If you haven't been capturing your ideas on paper, you're missing an opportunity to take them to the next level. I want you to begin capturing ideas on paper for the next 90 days. Look through your ideas and find one that you believe has great potential if you give it more thinking time. Now ask yourself the following questions to stretch that idea. Why do I like this idea? What are the underlying issues involved with it? What does this remind me of? What is the opposite? What metaphor or symbol helps explain it? What is the value of the idea? What's the hardest or most expensive way to carry it out? Remember, most limitations we face in life are not imposed on us by others. We place them there ourselves. Lack of creativity often falls into that category. If you want to be more creative, challenge boundaries. A creative environment appreciates the power of a dream. A creative environment encourages the use of a blank sheet of paper and the question, if we could draw a picture of what we want to accomplish, what would it look like? A creative environment allowed Martin Luther King Jr. to speak with passion to millions of people. I have a dream, not I have a goal. Goals may give people focus, but dreams give them power. Dreams expand people's world. Number four, spend time with other creative people. What if the place you work has an environment that is hostile to creativity and you possess little ability to change it? One possibility would be to change jobs. But what if you desire to keep working there despite the negative environment? 
Your best option is to find a way to spend time with other creative people. Creativity is contagious. Have you ever noticed what happens during a good brainstorming session? One person throws out an idea. Another person uses it as a springboard to discover another idea. Someone else takes it in yet another, even better direction. Then somebody grabs hold of it and takes it to a whole new level. The interplay of ideas can be electric. The more time you can spend with creative people engaging in creative activities, the more creative you will become. Number five, get out of your box. Actress Katherine Hepburn remarked, if you obey all the rules, you will miss all the fun. While I don't think it's necessary to break all the rules, many are in place to protect us, I do think it's unwise to allow self-imposed limitations to hinder us.